Hello, and thank you for joining us for FCLT Global's eighth web webinar on how long-term investors can manage their investment risk. This is our eighth and final, a grand finale for us. The subject today is moving from risk to opportunity through innovation and adaptive markets. We are able to convene this research as part of our purpose as a nonprofit research organization. We exist to apply our research in ways that move money in longer term directions, in this case, through risk management. Our panel today is fit for a grand finale and certainly exactly fit for the content that we are unpacking. We are joined first by Dr. Andrew Lowe. He is the author of Adaptive Markets, Financial Evolution at the Speed of Thought, professor at MIT and director of the MIT Lab for Financial Engineering. We're also joined by Sarah Williamson. Sarah chairs the board of the Whitehead Institute, a world renowned nonprofit research institution dedicated to improving human health through basic biomedical research. And as you all know, she is also the CEO of our organization, FCLT Global. When we bring this content to you, we do it on the basis foremost of a publication called Balancing Act, Managing Investment Risk for Multiple Time Horizons. We also have some content on this subject in our publication on institutional investment mandates, both of which are available on our website. I'd also like to offer a few programming notes before we open the conversation. If you have questions for either Dr. Lowe or for Sarah, please submit them to bryn.costello at fcltglobal.org. That email address also just appeared in the chat box. Please also message Bryn if you have any technical challenges and she will do her best to troubleshoot. By way of reminder, this session is being recorded. That is so that we can archive it on our website in the spirit of continuing professional education for long-term investment risk managers. Lastly, this is an hour long 60 minute session. We'll end promptly in order to respect your time and Dr. Lowe's time. It's a pleasure to be with you both. I'd like to introduce the first question and direct it to you, Dr. Lowe. Why does it matter practically that institutional investors focus on the long-term in the way that they manage risk, both for themselves and for society. What's the practical implication of that? Uh, well, first of all, let me start by uh, thanking you, Matt and Sarah and uh, FCLT Global for having me here today and convening this great event. It's really a pleasure and a privilege to be part of this. So in answer to your question, I think Horizon is one of the most important and yet one of the most neglected aspects of risk management because the risks over the short run are very, very different than the risks over the long run, uh, as are the rewards. And you know, we all say that investors like to balance risk versus reward, but you can't do that unless you know what those risks and rewards are. And you know, we think we know what the rewards are in the short versus the long run, mm -hmm. but it's much more difficult to think about all of the unknown unknowns. And there are a lot more of them in the long run than in the short run. So I think that starting to think about the different time horizons of the various kinds of risk is really the beginning to getting at that kind of risk management process much more effectively than what we've been doing so far. I appreciate that. Let me follow up with a quick question before sending the same one back to you, Sarah. I think an inference from that analysis is at a very easy level, it affects which opportunities get funded or do not get funded based on what you can see or not see. Is that right? And also, we know that you've really become a champion of the idea of funding for research, for example. Does that management of risk create a different sense of opportunity for moonshot investments like that one? Without a doubt, and that's really a great example. Uh, for, for in particular, the, uh, the example that I like to point to is the typical time horizon that it takes to develop an anti-cancer drug. Typically, mm -hmm. we're talking about the space of anywhere from five to 15 years. And that's really the, the minimum time before you reach a proof of concept in that particular space. So if you think mm -hmm. about making an investment in biomedicine, over the course of the first, I don't know, three to five years, you can expect zero return. And so if your time horizon is limited to that short window, you're gonna basically lose all your money because you're not gonna get anything back in that very, very narrow time slice. 
unless you start thinking about time horizons much more directly and attuned to the particular investment opportunity, you're actually going to be in a really serious disadvantage compared to other longer term investors. And biomedicine is just one of a number of examples where the long horizon actually matters. Sarah, you sit at an intersection of this type of work between the Whitehead Institute, your career at Wellington, and now leading this organization. What's your reaction to that analysis? I think it's it's so important, and frankly, it's very hard. I mean, if you think about something like just to pick on the Whitehead, where we had an opportunity to work together, that's an endowment that funds biomedical research in perpetuity. So it doesn't have a time frame, really. It doesn't have a liability in the classic sense of the word. So what time frame do you manage the money for? Um, we know the cost of research is rising more quickly than the cost of most things than typical mm -hmm. CPI. And so um, a, a more aggressive, longer term growth oriented approach makes a lot of sense. But if you're sitting there, you know, as we were about a year ago, watching the markets tank, um, you get a little bit nervous because, you know, believe it or not, the scientists actually, you need to, you need to get paid, right? You need to, you need to feed the mice. You need to do all those things. So it's extremely important in the short term to be able to meet those obligations. So what I yeah. always try to think about is, you know, at what level do you jeopardize, what level of risk do you jeopardize your mission and try not to cross that line, but push your mission um, mm -hmm. with jeopardizing your mission. And, and that's, that's, that's easier said than done. That's a challenging and an important charter for us about focusing on that mission and the purpose and being a good steward of it, but also really living into it. We've surfaced a couple of examples from the health domain now, and we are all taking these calls from our homes in various capacities. Many of the folks on the line are also in their homes. The reason is because we face a health challenge right now. So let's ask the timely question. What have we learned from COVID-19 about managing risk and about finding opportunity? Dr. Lowe, I'll go to you first. Well, you know, there are so many different uh, things that we should be learning from this experience, but I'll just name a couple. The first is that a, a financial crisis is not the same thing as a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. And right now, we are not facing a financial crisis. We are facing a public health crisis that has a number of financial implications. And that's the key insight that uh, I think will help us to unlock some of the risks that financial managers are facing right now. For example, if you look at the stock market, it's as if nothing is wrong uh, because stocks are doing just fine over the course of the last 12 to 18 months. We had a bit of a blip you know, from February to March of 2020, and it took until maybe June before the stock markets recovered to their pre-pandemic levels. But now we've exceeded those levels. And it's because the markets understand that the value of investments really go beyond the, the next one or two years. And there's no doubt that the financial crisis that started back in 2008 has had much longer term consequences than what we're seeing right now. And it's because we're not in a financial crisis. We need to deal with the public health issues. And once we do, we can then move on. The second thing I think we need to learn from the pandemic is that human nature is an incredibly strong force. Mm -hmm. And that the old adage that the markets can stay irrational a lot longer than you can stay solvent is a very important insight. The, the GameStop episode that we saw just a few weeks ago, I think is a case in point. So we really need to manage these kinds of exposures in a way that I don't think we're fully equipped to do so yet. We need to mm. incorporate human behavior fully into that risk management process. Sarah, what have we learned? Well, I guess just one quick thing I'll add is that, that risk managers in particular are often asked to predict the future, mm. um, you know, as if they have a crystal ball. And I think if there's one thing we've learned in the last you know, year, year and a half is that that's a pretty hard thing to do. So in fact, what we need to do is prepare for the unexpected more than try to predict the future. And that means this mindset of what is the dispersion of possible outcomes? What are scenarios that could happen rather than saying, well, we're, we're omniscient and we, and we know what's gonna happen next because anyone who's been in the markets for any um, amount of time, let alone the last year and a half, knows that we don't necessarily get it right in terms of what's coming next. 
I do want to advance, but Dr. Lowe, I think Sarah said some interesting things there, and I want to give you the chance to reply if you'd like. Uh, well, I couldn't agree more. I think that there are a number of challenges that we need to really be aware of and interact with each other to try to mm -hmm. sort through. And I don't know that the dialogue has really begun. I think there's a lot more that we need to do now in terms of sifting through the last 12 months of uh, behavior, as well as various different policies, to try to understand exactly what it is that worked, what, it, what didn't work, and why and what we need to do going forward. That's a really helpful segue, so I'll take that. There's various dimensions of behavior, the behavior that we're trying to influence, but also our own behavior. One to be very transparent that FCLT is trying to influence here is the behavior of investment risk professionals to focus more on their time horizons, to align to those time horizons, and for many institutions to focus more on the long term. A spirit of our grand finale is allowing this community that's come together around us for some time now to feel empowered not just as though they're observing, but as though they have influence. So I wanna ask a question about that. What are the ways in which an investment risk manager can shape opportunities for their fund, not just monitor, report, and project those? What influence do they have? Well, maybe I'll start. Um, yeah, I know that please. Sarah's got a lot of experience uh, in this as well. Um, so th there's a, an, another saying, uh, which is that you can't manage what you don't measure. And I find that really the beginning of any kind of significant management oversight, whether it's risk or, or any other activity, it really begins with metrics. You have to start measuring whatever it is that you're looking to manage, whether it's risk or expected return or impact or any other mm -hmm. uh, of the kind of goals that we have uh, as, uh, as managers. And so I think the risk manager actually plays a really critical role in being able to define the metrics by which we measure these mm. kinds of activities. So, so one case in point, when we think about different horizons, there are a number of different measures of risk over those horizons, and not all measures are created equal. You know, the typical volatility that we use, volatility over longer horizons is very hard to measure, and there are other metrics that you could use, tail probabilities, or in, in the cases of binary risk, probability of success or failure that you can use in concert with the typical measures. And when you start using different metrics, you notice that behavior changes in response to those new measures. I'd like to elicit a little bit of a dialogue here. Sarah, I'll turn to you with the same question, add to it, and then see if we can get some reaction to that. So the question originally is how can in, in risk managers rather shape the opportunities that their organizations pursue. I think Dr. Lowe ra laid out the examples quite persuasively. A follow-up to that is, do they understand that they have that influence, that they're going beyond informing, that they're in fact shaping? What's your experience from the real world there? And then uh, let's see if that evokes a dialogue. Yeah, I think that in, in some ways, um, people understand that in some ways they don't. So just as an example, I think one of the most important things is framing a decision for, let's say, an investment committee. You know, I've served on a lot of investment committees over the years, and you, someone presents, you know, we could do portfolio A or portfolio B or portfolio C. Usually the committee doesn't pick portfolio D or Z because it wasn't on the page, right? Usually they pick one of the things that was on the page. So whoever put those on the page really framed that decision. And then you get into, do I want A or B or C and what are the various trade-offs? So I think there's a huge ability to just frame that discussion and for, uh, for a risk manager or somebody who thinks about it this way to put forward a number of sensible solutions. What I would hope is that any of those portfolios on the page, you know, one might turn out better than the other, but all of them would basically, you know, meet the needs of the organization. And I think that that's what you want to do, particularly with an investment committee, which is so commonly made of people who um, are, are trying to do the right thing, perhaps rotate through and so on. You want to give them a number of good choices. It, it may or may not be the best, but a number of good choices, no really bad choices. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Framing is actually key in terms of mm. making good decisions. Uh, and a number of behavioral economists have documented that when you change the frame, you can change completely the outcomes because people's preferences are highly dependent on the context in which they're being presented. 
So I, I think we really have to be very careful uh, in terms of managing that type of framing and uh, you know, hopefully developing a consistent methodology for doing that would actually lead to more consistent investment decisions over time. Let me go deep on that with a follow-up question before we move on. Your writing is rich with behavioral analysis. The part that I can recall at the moment really focuses outward in anticipating the behaviors of those in the ecology or the environment around you. There's also quite the strenuous challenge of controlling and governing your own behaviors, following through on what you strategically want to do than perhaps how the short-term frame may orient you to behave. Do you have any reflections at that level of analysis when you're thinking introspectively rather than externally? Well, you know, it was really thinking introspectively that got me to realize that the typical models that we apply to risk management and other financial endeavors don't necessarily capture the sum total of all human behavior. Uh, you know, for example, we all know that that we ought to get to bed at a reasonable hour. But you know, once you start watching a really engaging movie, you can't help but finish it. You know you're going to pay for it the next day because you got an early morning meeting. And yet we all do this. You know, we all overeat. Uh, we, we all uh, you know, engage in, in certain activities that we ultimately know we're going to regret. And yet yeah. we do it anyway. And you know, that's human nature. Well, that kind of human nature is something we can incorporate into our risk management protocols. It's not easy, but we manage to do it in other walks of life. You know, there are certain things that we mandate by law because we know that human behavior is going to act against us. Uh, you know, for example, most office buildings have uh, sprinkler systems, uh, fire alarms, uh, clearly marked exits, things that are much more expensive to incorporate in a building than if you don't put them in. But we learned many years ago that when we leave it up to our own devices, we're not going to be spending the money to put in these fire protections until it's too late. You know, once a fire starts, we really wish we had a fire alarm and a sprinkler system. But by that time, it's really not feasible to put it in, you know, in the 30 seconds that it's going to take for your, before your building goes up in smoke. And so we learn to guard against that. And I think that's the same in risk management. Once you understand the nature of human behavior, you can start to begin to, to guard against it. Sarah, any reaction? I like the uh, the building on fire. Uh, I've always said, you know, you, you know you should eat the spinach, but you eat the cookie instead. So it's the same thing. I do think we have to build that in. And, you know, I think one way of doing it is um, sort of rules of thumb, you know, uh, you, you know, I, I, I'll eat one cookie, but I won't eat two. Why? Well, I don't know. It's just a good rule of thumb, you know? So it's, uh, so I think that there are um, tools, either, you know, a law, like you've got to have mm -hmm. a fire sprinkler or just your own um, habits. And I think investment committees can do the same thing too. And, you know, one is, for example, maybe a committee doesn't pick managers or maybe a committee only revisits their strategic asset allocation once a year, or they have decided in advance that they're not going to time the market. But it's always easier to make that behavioral decision, that decision well, when the fire, when if the, when the building's burning, then you're not making a decision. You're just reacting. So you've got to make that decision well in advance of when of when you see smoke. So I, I like that rule, um, and uh, in many cases, you know, it works quite well. I have to admit that the, the one cookie rule, I failed miserably at those Whitehead <laughs> Institute board meetings when they have these oatmeal raisin cookies. I can't just eat one of those. <laughs> I was going to point out something similar. The shortcoming of the one cookie rule is you only get one cookie. Let's, right. <laughs> <laughs> let's take the metaphorical conversation now and make it literal. We are a community of institutions that all share sincere and strongly held beliefs about the long term and about time horizon and that all struggle at various levels and in various ways with bearing those beliefs out in our behavior at certain points. What do we need to change in order to take advantage of the couple opportunities that we've discussed so far? I'll mention the COVID vaccine, the cure for cancer idea, the basic and applied research in biomedical. Do we need to change modeling assumptions, investment strategies, organizational structures, governance practices? What is it that can allow us to govern our behavior in that manner? Well, I'll start by uh, the Please. simple observation that we have to change our time horizon. I mean, it's exactly what FCLT is really focused on. It's 
changing the way we measure return from the three months, six months, one year, two year horizon to five and 10 years. And you know, that's hard. It's, it's hard to change that mindset. Mm -hmm. But I think once you begin to look at the longer run, all things begin to come into focus that you otherwise wouldn't have seen. And this is particularly true in biomedicine where, you know, with some of the amazing science that's going on at the Whitehead Institute, for example, you're not gonna see a return on any of that for maybe a decade or longer. But if you think about all the amazing cancer drugs that we have today, you can thank people like Bob Weinberg, a cancer biologist, for the decades of work that he's done that has now given us the so-called low-hanging fruit of all of these therapies. So once you understand the, the connection between the investment that you made 20 years ago into what you have today, it becomes somewhat easier <clears throat> to start focusing on that longer run because you are able to connect the dots. I'm going to jump in with a follow-up there that will segue, I think, nicely to Sarah. In your book, you share the story of this institute's founding and the individual who founded it. Would you mind sharing that story for us now, Dr. Loom? Uh, which institution? So the Whitehead Institute and the individual who was researching a rare disease that ultimately came back to his family. That was a, a really moving story, um, I have to say. It's about Harvey Lodish. And I've often told my students that, um, you know, once I learned about the story of Harvey, I decided right then and there, I want to be Harvey Lodish. And it has to do with the fact that in 1983, Harvey, who is a cell biologist, uh, assistant professor at the time, just starting out in his career, he was approached by a venture capitalist asking whether or not he would be willing to work with him to help develop a therapy for a rare condition known as Gaucher syndrome. It's a genetic mutation, a typo in your DNA that prevents your body from producing an important housekeeping enzyme. And, and without it, fatty acids start to build up in various organs. And by the time you reach puberty, <clears throat> you start feeling some pretty significant uh, debilitating effects. And, and by the time you reach your teenage years, uh, in so serious cases, you're dead. So this is a disease that had no therapy whatsoever. The people who had it were just unfortunately consigned to a life of uh, pain and a rather short one at that. So in 83, uh, Dr. Lodish and some of his colleagues uh, agreed to work with this venture capitalist to, to create a therapy to deal with it. And it was the first enzyme replacement therapy in the history of modern medicine. And in 1991, this drug Ceridase was approved and it, it saved you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of lives since then. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, really a, a miracle uh, drug. The little company that uh, Harvey and his colleagues uh, started, uh, some of you may have heard of it, it's called Genzyme. And uh, in 2011 or 12, it was acquired by uh, Sanofi for about $20 billion. Now, uh, that's not why I wanna be Harvey Lodish, although that's not a bad reason. It's not. I, I, I wanna be Harvey because what happened in 2002 in 2002, Harvey's daughter was pregnant with her second child, Harvey, and his wife's uh, second grandchild, uh, a boy named Andrew, great name, by the way. So um, Andrew was diagnosed in utero with Gaucher syndrome. W w what are the chances of that? Yeah. Incredible. And you know, when Andrew turned 10 in 2012, uh, he started developing the symptoms. So he had the, the, the serious version of it. Uh, but he's doing just fine, leading a totally normal life, thanks to the drug that uh, Grandpa helped to develop decades before. Yeah. And, and when I when I talked to Harvey, I, I asked him, you know, Harvey, did you uh, did you know in 1983 that you had the mutation for Gaucher's that was in your family? Harvey said, I had no idea. I uh, I was uh, just doing some cool science, and I thought that if it could help some patients, that would be really neat. And um, so he, he, it was just a, a complete uh, coincidence that the work that he was doing in the 80s ultimately ended up saving the life of, it, of his as yet unborn grandchild. Sarah, you helped lead this institution now. It's a really opportune moment just to uplift it and its mission. Let me allow you to react to that, share any storytelling that you might like, and then I'll follow up with a more specific question. Yeah, well, it's an amazing story. And I think that one of the things about the Whitehead that is so um, important is that it does things like, to, to use Dr. Lowe's words, because it's cool science, right? It's cool science. It's not because 
we can make money on this thing in, you know, three years, right? It's because, wow, this is interesting. And if you go back through the, it's been around since the 80s. If you go back through the, the discoveries that have come out of there, a lot of them have been very unexpected and they have been somebody pursuing something that was a puzzle or, or a curiosity or, oh, we could try this. And I think that that's what's really important about an institute like that that's affiliated with a place like MIT that has that creativity and that drive to discover. So, you know, the Whitehead is really about um, it, it's scientific diversity. It's a diversity of things that it's working on. It's not just working on cancer or just working on one thing. Mm -hmm. It's it's got this discovery mindset, this innovation mindset, which is it's you know it's developed tools that then other people have used later, um, and then it tries to inspire the next generation. If you if you wander around the circles of biology and look at where people trained as fellows, you'll find you'll find a lot of uh, people who've come through the Whitehead. But coming back to the yeah. investment, I think one of the things that's so important in this conversation is to recognize that sometimes the timeframes are just too long for people to invest in the classic sense of the word or the outcomes are too uncertain. So what one of the things that I find so interesting in, in biomedical research is that usually the very early stages are funded either by government grants or philanthropy. And so they're, they're not expecting a return on investment in the classic sense of the word. And then at some point you get to the more venture funding still highly risky, a lot of time. And then usually at some point you get to like your, like your Genzyme story, you know, somebody gets bought by a big company and then they can take the, the, the discovery and actually implement it and distribute it to get it to the patients and so on. So one of the things that is so important about this chain, and frankly, one of the reasons that the United States has led in terms of some of this COVID vaccine development is that funding at every single stage of that process. And so that, that, that's, uh, that's my one pitch for, uh, if there's one year that we should understand why it's important to fund basic research, uh, hopefully we understand that in uh, 2021. I'm gonna get you to react to that, please, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a really important insight. I used to think that biomedicine was kind of a relay race, you know, because you have phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, and you're basically handing off the project from one group of investors to another. I've now come to realize that it's more like an Ironman triathlon because it is a much longer, much more risky and much more expensive process. It's really, really hard. And to Sarah's point, unless you have the fundamental science at the very outset, mm -hmm. you don't actually get to have all of that low hanging fruit 20 years later. You really need to have that entire process and a good case in point is the vaccines that we yeah. enjoy today. You know, Moderna created the vaccine from the time they received the sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to the time that the first patient was dosed with that vaccine, 63 days, 63 days. Yeah. The, 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 the previous record for the fastest vaccine that was developed was five years and that was the mumps vaccine, yeah. five years for the development of it. So it's extraordinary. We're living through extraordinary times, but, but the mRNA technology that came about because of decades of fundamental science right. that went into the various different journals that have now been used to build this incredible medical breakthrough. And so I think we really need to focus on that entire value chain and remember that it really starts with an investment in, in research, that's not an investment that private investors are gonna get a return on, but that's where the public investment comes in. Dr. Lowe, I'd like to give you this opportunity to also just share some details of the thinking you've done about the cure for cancer, right? This is a direct analogy for it, but also an area where you're innovating precisely because of the problems that you and Sarah just identified. Can you share the story that brought you to that and also the innovations that you're trying to advance in getting that funding together? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, four people that were close to me uh, all developed cancer within the space of two, three years. And uh, during that period of time, uh, they, they all died. And I, I was just really shocked by that. And then 
Shortly thereafter, two more people that I, I were colleagues of mine at MIT, they passed away. And it was a really big wake up call. I, I hadn't really been touched by death so personally up until that point, I was quite fortunate. But within that time frame, all these people were dying of cancer around me. At one point I thought somehow knowing me was carcinogenic. But then I realized that, you know what, everybody, everybody has been touched by cancer, either directly or indirectly through a, a loved one or a, a family member. And so at that point I started to try to be a, a bit more educated in terms of understanding what they were going through, um, trying to be helpful, uh, trying to offer some kind of comfort if not advice, because at the point I, I, I didn't have any advice, I didn't know anything about the disease or how drugs were developed. And it was through that process that I started reading about the whole drug development uh, ecosystem. And something really weird uh, emerged from that um, investigation. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the conundrum that, that I came to was the fact that the science was moving really quickly. And there were all sorts of new ideas, new therapeutic interventions that were being proposed by people at Whitehead and, and the Koch and Broad and other institutions around the world. And while the science was progressing, there was this bottleneck, the so-called valley of death, where it was really hard to get funding, particularly at that very early stage of what's called translational medicine, where you're trying to translate ideas from the laboratory and bring them into the clinic. And I didn't understand why there was a valley of death. I mean, I just assumed that if there was a really good idea for how to deal with cancer, and there obviously are a number of cancer patients that are dying from that disease, you would be able to get the money to, to deal with it and develop the drug. And I was really shocked to learn that in, in a number of cases, a number of prominent cases with really great scientists that have clearly have had a track record in being able to make these breakthroughs, they couldn't get money. And it was particularly difficult during recessions. So now I'm thinking, well, geez, why does the economy have an influence on how people develop cancer drugs? Because it seems like those two things are completely uh, unrelated. And at that point, you know, it, it sort of dawned on me that obviously you need money in order to take these projects forward. And that along the way, if the money stops flowing, if there's an interruption in that kind of financing, then the projects are completely trashed. Uh, and and that, that made me realize that finance actually plays a big role in drug development. In many cases, too big a role. Uh, sometimes the finance ends up driving the research agendas of these biotech and pharma companies. Yeah. And from my point of view, as an outsider to the industry, as the son of a then dying patient, uh, my mother, um, I, I thought this was absolutely outrageous. It seemed to me that the science ought to be driving the financing, but it actually has to do with the horizon. You know, if you're focusing on the short run, as many of these companies have to, then you have to basically do what you can with the money that you have, and that means prioritizing. If instead you focused on the long run, if you had investors mm -hmm. that focused on the long run, that would completely reverse that calculus. And then you would actually be able to allow the science drive the financing. So what I've been working on with various collaborators is to try to develop better methods using financial engineering to come up with better methods for financing biotech and pharma projects so that you can actually move things uh, from the laboratory into the clinic much more expeditiously and in a way that actually gives investors a better rate of return. I just want to underline for the audience, we have now a very personal and powerful example of the way that risk professionals can shape the opportunities that get pursued in our society. This is about the allocation of that risk in a viable manner and it can produce cures for cancer. Absolutely, you know, I, I realize that I will never be Harvey Lodish in the sense that I don't have an MD or a PhD in molecular biology. I can't develop the therapeutics, but I realize that actually all of us can be Harvey Lodish yeah. if we invest in the therapies that will save our as yet unborn grandchildren. Sarah, I wanna take it to something very practical before we go into this theory that Dr. Lowe is developing. Returning to this question about particular things that we might need to change to control our risk seeking and risk management behavior. You've been my longest teammate in this work. FCLT has been at it for three years now. You have the benefit of all of that observation. 
I'd like to hear your thoughts about what we need to change behaviorally or organizationally within investment organizations so that risks like these are taken in support, as you said, of the long-term purpose of an investment organization. Well, I think if I could pick one thing, it's the incentives. So the question is, are short-term targets or incentives actually aligned with long-term goals? And that sounds really basic, like why wouldn't they be? But they're often not. So, um, you know, really simple example, if you have an incentive to stick close to a benchmark, limit your tracking error, you're going to own companies, you may underweight them, but you're going to own companies that you don't believe in for the long run. You're still going to own them. So why are you doing that? So I think that that's the kind of question we have to ask ourselves, which is, um, what does it, in, you know, incentives incent, right? So what does an incentive actually encourage somebody to do? I often hear, well, yeah, that's their incentive, but we don't expect them to, you know, just do that. Well, you know, the, I think what we've learned is that incentives really drive behavior. So I think if I have to pick one thing, it's take a simplistic approach to what incentives are driving and see if there's a way to make those change to align better with the long-term goals. Thank you. It reminds me of a quote. I think it came from Dan Ariely, although I've struggled to source it recently, but the quote was the problem with incentives is not that they don't work, but that they can work too well. <laughs> you can over-focus or over-specify. Dr. Liu, I had a question submitted from our community in advance of this session. It's a fun and very simple question, and I'm going to use it to advance our conversation. What is physics NV or theory NV, and why is it hazardous to your wealth? Well, that's a great question. Thank you for raising that. Um, it, it's a paper that I wrote uh, a number of years ago with a colleague, Mark Mueller. Uh, and the idea behind physics envy that we co economists all seem to share is that we would love to have three laws that explain 99% of all economic phenomena. And the way that physicists, they have three laws, Newton's three laws that explain 99% of observable behavior. Instead, you know, economists have 99 laws that explain maybe 3% of, of economic behavior, and it really, really frustrates us. Uh, and, and, you know, for a variety of reasons, the economics profession really started out in the 1940s focusing on theory first and then empirical verification afterwards in, in much the way that physicists do. And it's gotten to the point where I think theorists get a lot of the glory uh, until relatively recently. And, and the empirical verification of the theories uh, often got short shrift. And, and I think part of that is, is very much along the lines of how physicists behave. You know, you've got a theory that predicts the existence of a certain particle, and then you've got a bunch of experimental physicists that take years or in some cases decades to try to find those particles. And it, it seems really cool. So, you know, when I told one of my physicist friends who actually happens to know a lot of economics, I told him that I thought, um, you know, economists had physics envy. He turned to me and says, no, you don't. You guys don't have physics envy. You have theory envy. You, you like doing theory, but you don't like doing physics. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, this is how physicists behave. Usually they start with a theory. It has a prediction. And then they go test it by collecting data. And when the data disagree with the theory, they reject the theory. Whereas you economists, you reject the data. <laughs> and I have to say, you know, guilty, guilty is charged. And, and that's part of the reason that I, I struggle so much with the, uh, the efficient markets hypothesis. That's a theory, a beautiful theory, a very powerful theory that actually works most of the time. But when you confront it with data, as I did when I was an assistant professor, I couldn't get it to work in certain contexts and it really frustrated me. And, you know, for a few years, I have to admit, I, I rejected the data and, and focused on the theory until I couldn't any longer. And that's what ultimately got me to work on the, uh, the adaptive markets hypothesis. Can you share that hypothesis with us? Well, it's really the antidote to theory envy. It basically recognizes that financial markets are not a physical system, but rather a biological system. 
And so the adaptive markets hypothesis really says that you know, individual market participants are human. They make mistakes. They try to do the best they can, so the markets are highly competitive, but they're not perfect. And periodically, we suffer from these kinds of, of human irrationalities, uh, the fight or flight syndrome, for example. And those kinds of evolutionary adaptations are very important in protecting us from physical harm, but they don't do very much in protecting us from financial harm. And so uh, risk managers, I think, really need to think about the financial market dynamics as emanating not so much from physical causes, trying to find the equation that explains market behavior, but rather to try to understand human psychology, human behavior, physiology, and then build that into their risk management protocols. A forewarning, Sarah, I'm going to now ask Dr. Lowe a couple quick uh, succession questions. They're gonna take us into the details real quickly. And I'm gonna to come to you to see your reaction as somebody who's had this profession for a career. Dr. Lowe, the couple of concepts I want to explore, particularly for a risk manager audience, are the concepts of resilience and uncertainty. I think this is one way in which it gets hard for the practice as it exists today. And forgive me, I'm gonna to refer to my notes here, but there are a couple of points of your book that I wanted to surface. One theme was the idea that nature abhors an undiversified bet. And in this sense, we're talking about diversification in the context of the investment environment and behavior, not just financial correlations. And then you also write that the adaptive markets hypothesis predicts that the only kinds of heuristics that will survive will be those that hedge their bets to some degree. This is not optimization. This is not efficiency. Is it resilience? And does resilience present opportunity? Uh, absolutely. So I think this is a really important point that is not part of the typical risk manager's perspective, but in a way ought to be because that's what risk managers really do. So the idea behind the phrase, the nature abhors an undiversified bet, it, it's a pretty simple idea. Uh, the point is that if we put all of our bets on one outcome and that outcome doesn't happen, we lose everything. And so you can see this principle in all sorts of aspects of ecological systems. You know, for example, this notion of biodiversity, the fact that, that we've got lots of different species and these species differ in how they react to different environments. Why is that the case? I, it, it seems like once you optimize for a particular kind of behavior in a particular kind of environment, that should be what you do forever after. And everybody should do the exact same thing. So, you know, in the depths of the ocean, the great white shark is one of the most fearsome predators. Why isn't all fish like the great white shark? Why do we have different species? And the answer is, is that when the environment changes, the nature of the advantages that the great white shark enjoys may no longer persist. And so you, just by the process of natural selection, will see a diversity of approaches to dealing with an otherwise hostile environment. And I think we see that most clearly in the financial realm in the hedge fund industry. The hedge fund industry is the Galapagos Islands of finance because you, you can see evolution <laughs> happening year by year. And not all strategies work in all conditions. We've got high frequency traders, but we've also got Warren Buffett. And so you've got very, very different approaches to making money because market environments are different. So, so once you understand that there are differences in how the business conditions evolve, that's gonna dictate differences in how we respond. And so that kind of diversity is really important. Yeah. Let me also go quickly to this concept of uncertainty, which of course the room will understand is different from risk. You bring life to this concept in a number of your writings through storytelling, the storytelling of Knightian uncertainty, and also the storytelling of an individual named Daniel Ellsberg, who was able to tee up some exercises that would elicit responses like this from regular people. Could you share those stories and also explain how adaptive markets hypothesis helps an institutional risk manager think about uncertainty? Sure. Well, that's a really uh, interesting point that was raised by uh, this Daniel Ellsberg many, many decades ago. Uh, for the viewers, you'll probably recall the name Ellsberg associated with the Pentagon Papers. 
But before he mm -hmm. was famous for the Pentagon Papers, Daniel Ellsberg was actually quite a well-respected psychologist and behavioral economist. And the Ellsberg paradox is a really interesting phenomenon, and it goes something like this. Um, if I uh, give you a, a, a simple gamble where I've got an urn that has 50 red balls and 50 black balls, and I ask you to pick a color, red or black, don't tell me what it is, write it down on a piece of paper, and I pick a ball out of this urn, and we play the following game. If the ball that I pick is the color you chose, I'll pay you $10,000. But if it's not, I'll pay you nothing. So if we play this game exactly once, the question is how much would you be willing to pay mm -hmm. to play this? Now, if you don't have any particular risk tolerance or risk preference, if you're risk neutral, then on average you would pay the expected value, which is $5,000, right? Because you've got a 50-50 chance of red or black. But it turns out that um, if we play with a different urn where I don't tell you what the proportion of red or black balls is, people will pay far less for that because they don't know what the distribution can be. Mm -hmm. It turns out that mathematically, those two situations are actually identical. Because if you don't know, then in fact, it may as yeah, well be 50-50. It converges. Right. And, and yet, when, when you're given this experiment, in many, many different settings, this has been uh, replicated, investors will pay far less for the unknown unknowns, even though in this very, very narrow case, they are actually identical. And it, it highlights the distinction that uh, Ellsberg made between mm -hmm. the risk that we can parametrize and then the, the kind of randomness that we can't parametrize, we can't actually put a number on. And so that's a very interesting insight about human behavior. We, we are willing to take risk. We are not as willing to take uncertainty, the, the unknown unknowns. So from a risk management perspective, what this means is that markets will react very, very differently to things that it has never seen before or things that cannot be quantified. A good case in point is when COVID-19 hit US shores in the middle of February. It has been many, many decades, 1918 to be precise, yep. since the US has experienced a pandemic of the proportions that we've seen with COVID-19. And so it's not surprising that markets tanked and stayed down for about a month before they began to recover. And so it takes time for markets to digest these unknown unknowns. But eventually, mm -hmm. people figure it out. And so now we know exquisite detail about the infection rates, the mortality rate, and so on regarding COVID-19. So what started out as uncertainty has now become risk mm -hmm. and actually pretty manageable risk given that we've got vaccines and other therapeutics and right. the case numbers are going down and we can observe literally day by day, we can see the number of infections, the number of deaths, and we can track that very, very carefully. Sarah, you've had a career in asset management and also the privilege to serve on a number of asset owner boards, including in the health space. I think you've now heard that that career has been one where you were uh, confronting natural selection and environmental changes, unknown unknowns. What reaction do you have to the ideas that Dr. Lowe just laid out and how have you encountered them in trying to maintain a long-term focus professionally? So I think that this, you know, unknown unknowns is really important. You're staring into an abyss of something that you really don't understand, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic or um, the, the fall of 2008. And you see things that, you know, you've, you've been in the markets for a long time and you think you know how something's going to react and it reacts very differently than that. Mm -hmm. You sort of lose your footing, if you will. I think that is when people do um, react. And I think that the, the best things, at least that I've always found to do, are to try to look back at similar things in history. Um, Matt, you may recall, we wrote an article that was published in the Wall Street Journal on around the 1st of April of last year that felt a little risky to write, frankly, at the time, um, which said, look at the 1918 pandemic. Yes, it was. We, we weren't as eloquent as Dr. Lowe was, but look at what happened. It recovered quickly. This is a serious public health crisis but it isn't um, a financial problem. Now, that was a very counter point of view at the time. And frankly, I didn't expect the market to recover as quickly as it did. But if you look at history, 
you see that these things do happen. So I think that the, the best way is to try to refine your footing with a similar situation. And of course you may mm. get it wrong. You're not going to pick the exact turn, um, but it's, it's trying to understand what has happened at other times. And then to your point on resilience, what can you take? How much loss can you take or what, what can you, um, because if, if you're out of business, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. So uh, can't, can you withstand that? So I've always just tried to think of those two things. What's the, what, mm. what can we learn from history, even if it might not repeat and, and, and how resilient are we really um, when you're, when you're facing those sort of looking into the abyss situations? Well, you know, history may not repeat, but it does rhyme. And uh, actually that's a, an important analogy that you bring up, Sarah, because if you look at what happened after 1918, first of all, you're right that the recovery was very quick, but more importantly, the period where the businesses were really challenged with the pandemic allowed them to basically reconfigure their structures to make themselves more efficient. Going into the 1920s, we saw tremendous economic growth. In fact, the term roaring 20s was about the fact that there was tremendous growth for a decade. And, and ultimately, mm -hmm. that growth led to a number of financial excesses that gave us the 1929 stock market crash and the depression that followed. So I think if you use that rhyme and apply mm -hmm. it to the current mm -hmm. situation, I think we are actually going to see the roaring 20s in, in the next decade. And I worry that with all of the stimulus that we are now injecting into the economy, I worry that we are actually building the mm. next financial crisis. I think that by 1930, or by 2030, excuse me, uh, we're gonna see um, some potentially serious consequences of the financial excesses that are currently now being created with the, uh, the different kinds of government policies. So we really need to be careful over the next few years, the, the, the government risk managers, uh, the regulators need to think seriously about taking the foot off the accelerator within the next year or two before we end up overdoing it. And can I just add to that different countries are doing this differently. So um, some countries like ours are, are stimulating maybe for very good reason. Some others like China haven't, haven't used, you know, haven't used that dry powder in some of the same way. So it's also, on a relative basis, how, how does that play out over the next decade, for example? We're nearing the end of our time together and we will end promptly. I want to get in a quick question that is practical and applied and then a question to conclude that's more inspirational. I'm gonna ask the same question in, in two different ways, one to you, Dr. Lowe, and one to you, Sarah. So Dr. Lowe, a core principle of the quote, new investment paradigm that you've published is one where investors sometimes cannot afford to wait for the long term and have to be proactive in the interim. We should think critically about our own ideas. We should introspect. What does that insight mean for how we define long-term behavior for an institutional risk manager? I think it means that we have to constantly question our current investment theses and be careful not to fall in love with our own press releases. You know, it's, it's human nature to develop a certain degree of attachment and ownership to an idea. But, you know, one of the things that you learn very quickly in academia is the benefits of being part of this collection of independent thinking individuals that really criticize your work at a moment's notice. You know, when, when you're speaking at an academic conference, uh, it's actually a, a pretty humbling process to hear a number of other like-minded academics take your work to task and uh, point out all of the flaws that you've made. But that's really how we develop our ideas. They're shaped by the kind of criticism that we get. And we need to learn to embrace that. It, it's very tough because you're basically trying to learn to embrace pain. So, mm -hmm. so maybe you have to be a little masochistic uh, to, to be able to survive in this kind of environment. But, but being open to criticism, uh, seeking criticism, seeking mm -hmm. uh, the kind of opposing views to challenge your current position, I think is the beginning of that process of, of developing uh, wisdom. Sarah, I wanna ask you the same question just with an applied twist on it. Let's run with the words that Dr. Lowe used there of embrace pain. We can do that, but we also have our limits. And this I think is where the idea of multi-horizon risk management has come through for us. Can you share 
real world application of that and take it to the place of why it's important to manage investment risk over multiple time horizons? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that as you were saying that, I was thinking that the markets sort of uh, find our flaws um, <laughs> and flick pain in a way s similar uh, to, to what the, the academics do. I mean, I think that, you know, the way that I think about applying that is um, we will have flaws. We will have flaws in our investment process or in our, um, in our allocation at some point, and there will be um, pain. So the question is always this, um, over what time frame uh, do you do you feel the pain? And frankly, if you look at your portfolio every minute of the day, you know we, you're going to feel a lot more pain than if you look at once a quarter or once a year or whatever, it, or, or when it crosses a certain threshold. Um, so I think that some of this is behavioral, which is are you inflicting that pain on yourself? And then the other is mm -hmm. what do you do? Uh, how do you distinguish? This is always the hard question in investing. How do you distinguish, distinguish pain that just comes with the uh, territory? And to back to uh, to, to Dr. Lowe's uh, marathon analogy, you know, is it is our Ironman analogy? You know, is this pain that's just you got to fight through it because you know you're almost at the finish line, or is this a heart attack? Right, you've got to decide. And and I think that that's one. That's always the the hard part, and that's really what a risk manager kind of has to figure out. Is this is this pain threatening the patient or is this pain something we've just got to suck it up and get through? Dr. Lowe, you've been the grand finale of this series for us. I want to give you the chance to offer some words of inspiration for a community that's now been gathering monthly for the academic year. What one charge would you give to institutional risk managers now to culminate thinking like this? Well, I guess I'm going to go back to the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates, who said, know thyself. I think that knowing your own limits, knowing how much pain you can withstand, knowing what your pain points are, and understanding that we are all human and we will therefore react to pain in a very predictable way, I think that's the beginning of being able to build long-term wealth for your investors. Because you really have to acknowledge that while we are all rational, some of the time, we are almost always irrational during these extreme moments of distress and they will occur. So it, once we develop that perspective and start thinking about humans as creatures of habit, as well as creatures of thought, uh, we will actually be able to develop much better policies, both for managing risk and building long-term wealth for our investors. Sarah? I'm not sure I can add much to that except to say that I think to take this mindset of a biological system to come back to sort of where we started and really think about what that means rather than a physical system is is so important because I think what we find in investing is that uh, you don't get the same react, a, a, you know, an equal action doesn't get the same reaction every time. And that's a frustrating thing. Um, uh, but you, you, if a, if a risk manager can switch out the, the physical mindset for that biological adaptive mindset and follow this thinking, it really does change the way um, that, that you can um, go through the, these, these bumps that the, that the markets really will will bring. This brings us to conclusion. I want to begin by saying thank you, Dr. Lowe. Thank you, Sarah. Also, we appreciate you both being here with us today quite a lot. Pleasure. Thank you. Well, let me just add my thanks to you, Andy. Really appreciate your insights and your leadership in this field. Yeah. And just a reminder that, you know, your work is leading to more funding of things like Cures for Cancer, which is leading to yeah. more living better lives. And so, we all get in our little investment worlds of risk and return and so on, but but translating that to um, to, to the way people live is is really what it's all about. So we, we can't we can't forget that higher. Mm -hmm. Great. I also want to remind our audience of the reason why we've done this work. We want to move money in long term directions with insights like these. To that end, we're available to help anyone in the room with that sort of behavior change. You can reach me at matthew.leatherman at fcltglobal.org. We'll be happy to have that conversation. 
Also, all of our material is published on fcltglobal.org backslash resources. As we come to a conclusion, I also want to make a special effort to thank so many of my colleagues who were able to make this work possible. Bryn Costello produced the entire series. Alan, he has been my collaborator in all of the research that's underpinned our conversations here. Ariel Babcock heads research for FCLT Global and has provided space for this series. Steve Boxer, Sarah Simons have helped involve quite a few of you in the participation room in the series. And Ross Parker has additionally been helpful in disseminating material after these sessions so that people can view it into posterity. That's been a core part of our purpose, not just having the conversation now, but making it available as professional education on a standing basis. Lastly, my word of thanks is to the so many people in this room who have participated today and throughout this series. We see you, we appreciate you. We're here to help you focus capital on the long term whenever you need to reach out. Thank you again. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.